what would you ask a billionaire if you got the chance? Well, you actually now do have the chance this evening. Would you ask him about how he earned his first million or billion? What strategies were used to become successful? What investment ideas could he give you? Well, we are talking to the man himself tonight, Michael Lee Chin, about his business journey and what plans he has for his business and the future businesses and the future. As you know, he's been in the news a lot lately. So let's welcome Michael Lee Chin. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Kalila. How are you? I am good. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. Where nice. are you joining Happy us to from? Be here. Where are you joining us from this evening? You're obviously not on the yacht or the helicopter. So <laughs> where are you right now? I'm, I'm joining from Burlington, Ontario, Canada. In Canada. Okay. Is, is it warm in Canada right now? Is summer Beautiful. Changing? Beautiful today. All nice right. time of the year. Very nice. Well, let me just say it's an absolute pleasure to have you on our show, Mr. Leachin. The last time I spoke with you, oh, it was a while ago, probably at least five years ago when you were with the Economic Growth Council and, you know, the whole five and four and that whole discussion. And even though you don't need much of an introduction, you may be new to our audience. It's your first time on the show. So just tell them a bit about Michael Leachin. Oh, you're going to ask questions? You yes, ask questions I'm, I'm and I'll answer. You to, yeah, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background for those who might not have been living on a rock and might not know you. <laughs> well, I was uh, I, I was born in Port Antonio, Jamaica in 1951 to uh, a, a single parent. Uh, she had me when she was 18 years old. And when she had me, she was without a job for, for the first six months of my life. So we both of us were taken in by the helpers at the local supermarket. So we were both uh, adopted actually by the helpers of the local supermarket in Port Antonio. So uh, I was the first member of my family to have gone to high, high school. No, not, sorry, to university. I, got us, I, I worked after graduating from Excelsior, Titchfield, a O levels, then Excelsior, A levels. I worked for a year on a cruise ship, uh, and then and and also at Alpart in Saint Elizabeth. And I wanted to save enough money to go to to take me through university for the first year. Uh, so I, which I did. I, at the time, it was two thousand dollars Canadian to get through first year per year for everything: room, books, tuition, etc. I went to Canada having saved the first 2000, not knowing where second uh, financing for my second, third, nor fourth year uh, was going to come from. So I just went anyway, young, adventurous. So at the end of first year university, I got a job on campus laying on the landscaping team. So my job was to lay sod. So come July, middle of the summer, I'd saved saved $600. I needed 2000 to come for the next year. So mm. middle of July, I thought, where am I going to get the next $1,400 from? So I did exactly what every starving student would do. I, mm -hmm. wrote, to the I wrote to the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Mr. Hugh <laughs> Shearer. And I said, Mr. Shearer, I'm a starving student in Canada, engineering student. And I... I've been writing to your services commissions for a bursary scholarship help, and no one has responded. Mr. Shearer, you cannot, but I notice that you send an emissary of recruiters every year to recruit the graduates. Mr. Shearer, you cannot harvest unless you sow. To my surprise, Kalila, a month later, I got a, uh, a letter from the ministry of, from his office. Say, next time you come to Jamaica, come and see me. So I took mm -hmm. $400 of my 600 bought a ticket to Jamaica, and went to see Mr. Shearer. Wow. <laughs> right? So I didn't see him. I met his permanent secretary, and I presented my grades, and my grades were reasonable. So, that, so I got a scholarship. For the next three years, I needed 2000 I got a scholarship of $5,000 per year. 
Wow. I was able to send money back to my family. So because my life was enabled by the largest of Jamaican taxpayers, I'm forever, uh, uh, forever indebted to my country, or else I wouldn't be here otherwise. So that's a big Wow. That's a, <laughs> I absolutely love that story. It's my first time hearing that that story. You took a huge risk. So you took 400 out of the 600 that you had saved. You yes. needed 2,000. So you ended up deeper in the hole. You ended up <laughs> needing even more. <laughs> but that 400 turned into 5,000. Yes, per so, year. Per year. Per year. Per yes. year. All right. So how did you get your start in business? So now I, I, I um, graduated from engineering in 1974, being on a scholarship, I had to come back to Jamaica, which I did and worked for two years for the Ministry of Works. After two years, I came back to Canada and I couldn't get a job in engineering. This was 1976. I sent out 100 resumes for engineering jobs. I got 100 rejections. Wow. I had three non-engineering job offers. The first was to be a soap salesman. The second was to be uh, the second was to be uh, a long haul truck driver, and the third was to sell mutual funds to Canadians. Now I didn't know what a mutual fund was, but I got that. I got. I had that option. No, this, yeah. The third was to sell mutual funds. So all non engineering jobs, I opted for to sell mutual funds. Now, I didn't know what a mutual fund was. And I had to sell to Canadians. And I don't look like a Canadian. I don't sound like a Canadian. And at the time, Canada was not as cosmopolitan as it is today. So I had to call, call. And when someone said to me, Mike, okay, come and see me at my home. I would ask myself the question, wow. Well, first I would say, wow, I felt such a debt of gratitude that these people, this family would want to invite me to their home to listen to what I have to say. Because of that, I felt such a debt of gratitude that I said to myself, Mike, what can you do for these people, this, these, these families that are inviting you to listen to you in their home? What can you do as recompense for their graciousness? What's the highest value add you can give to them? The answer kept coming back to me, Mike, make them wealthy. If you can do that, you will transform their life. Oh, is there a formula that if you practice consistently, the only outcome is wealth? Because if there's such a formula, I wanted to know what that formula was. At the time, 1977 now, there was no Google, so you couldn't Google it. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure it out. So by 1980, I figured it out. I figured out and I codified it. And, and then I lived it. I wanted to be the role model for this formula. So when Kalila, your, 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 your nephew, your daughter, your, your son comes and says, Mommy, how is wealth created? You can say there's a formula. No different from mixing two atoms of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen, you get water every time. So what, what did I codify as a formula to create wealth back in 1980? That's 70, what 80, we all want to know. What is the formula? Tell us. Okay, so what I wanted to do was to, what, what I figured out was the common threads between every single wealthy person. People who created wealth, not inherited it, not got, not, not who were not born into it, not who didn't marry into it, but created it. And I figured that, so I, I went, as an engineer, there's a process you go through when you're looking at solving any problem. Number one, you observe. Number two, from your observations, you create a hypothesis. Then you stress test your hypothesis. Thirdly, if it holds true, you codify it. And then last, you hardwire it. So I observe wealthy people. And I noticed that they all did, sorry, I remember people who created the wealth. They all did five things. The first thing they did, and by the way, Kali, like, let me walk you through it. You think of any wealthy person who created it anywhere in the world, okay? Don't tell me who. And I'm going to tell you the five things that that person you're thinking of did to have created wealth. Number mm -hmm. one, that person, Kalila, created wealth by owning a few, not too many, 
high quality businesses. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Number two, that person really understands those few businesses. Am I right? Yes. Number three, that per those businesses are domiciled, located in, in an industry that has strong long-term long growth characteristics. Absolutely. Number four, that person used other people's money to have created the wealth. Yes, very And true. lastly, Kalila, that person's attitude towards ownership is, I'll hold these businesses, these few businesses, for as long as they remain high quality and the industries within which their domicile remains in a strong long-term growth trend. So those Ooh. are the five things that everybody who did, created wealth did. So all I now need to do, so that's a framework. And all I now need to do was execute on the framework and stick to it, which is what I did. So what was your first business? My first business was, uh, well, firstly, uh, another, we talk, another it's, it's essential necessity to create wealth is what I now codify as the three P's. The first P is you have to be able to predict where a sector is going, where an industry is going, right? Where a country is going. You have to be able to predict. That's the first P. Then you have to plan for your prediction. And then thirdly, you have to persevere with your plan. So if you mm. do the three Ps, you will prosper. Okay? Oh. <laughs> so predict, plan, and persevere. So what did I predict? And persevere, prosper. Uh, yes, mm. ex exactly. What did I predict? I predicted back in 1983 that the money management business, the asset management business, would be in a strong long-term growth mode. So how did I conclude that? With a high degree of confidence, whereby I would go out and borrow a lot of money to put into one stock. I'll, I'll explain to you how I predicted. Well, I'm a member of the baby boomer community cohort. So that's bookended by people who were born between 1946 and 1964. And I'm smack bang in the, in the middle. And the baby, boom, baby boomer cohort, cohort is the largest cohort in the North America, was the largest cohort in the North American population back in the late 70s, early 80s, about 30% of the North American population. So whatever that cohort does, because they are such a large percentage of the population, whatever they are doing en masse as a group, there goes the economy. So in 1983, I was 32. So I thought, so what do 32-year-old families, what are they doing today? Well, they're, they're um, buying a home, they're buying a car, refrigerator, they're, they're, they're consuming. So therefore, 30% of the North American population is engaged in consumption. So we're in a consumption boom right now. But... You don't make money. You don't create any wealth by doing what people are doing today. You create wealth by doing, by doing today what they'll be doing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I, I'm 32. People are, we are cons we're all consuming. What will 10 years from now, what will 42-year-old Mike be doing? Or the, the likes of 42-year-old Mike? In the, uh, the median age in the baby boomer cohort, 10 years from now, we're 42. Well, at 42, you're going to say, oh my gosh, I've been consuming for the last couple of decades. I need to, retirement is coming up in 23 years, 65. I don't have enough money saved. So all of a sudden, coming, the, the largest percentage of the North American population will wake up and say, oh my gosh, I don't have enough money saved. I need to save and invest. So there's coming a saving and investing boom. Predict based on demographics. So how do I participate in that? Well, uh, <clears throat> I can buy shares in a bank. When you buy shares in a bank, you can get loan losses. So that's not the bullseye. I could buy shares in an insurance company. When you buy shares in an insurance company, you can suffer from underwriting losses. So that too is not the bullseye. Or I can buy shares in an asset management business, bullseye. So I went out as a young man, 32, and borrowed $500,000 Canadian dollars, half a million, 
It was more than my net worth then to put into one stock. A stock called McKinsey Financial Corporation, which is a money management company, because it met the five criteria. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, number one, it was a high quality business. Number but two. You hmm. were working there at the time, no? No, no, no. I used to sell their products. And ah, I was, that's what it was. I was, yes. would sell their products. So you were very, understood. very familiar with their products. I was very familiar with their products. I was very familiar with the industry. Uh, I knew the margins from uh, the, uh, the margins pertaining to each product. I understood the regulatory environment. Uh, I understood where the industry was going, etc. So I went out and borrowed half a million dollars to put into one stock, McKenzie. I bought at one dollar per share in nine, October of 1993. And also, I went and bought Berkshire Hathaway shares, Mr. Warren Ooh. Buffett shares, back in 1983. Wow. Right? <laughs> Talk so about So the McKenzie shares went from $1 in 1983, October, to $7 in, by 1987, in four years. So 500000 became $3.5 million. That gave wow. me my start. So how did you get that loan, though? Somebody was asking in the comments, talk about using other people's money. Not anybody can go into a financial institution and borrow $500,000. Well, you see, you see, I remember I was selling mutual funds. I was selling. So I, I had a very good, I, I was, uh, I, I had a very good uh, commission flow. Uh, in 1983, I made $750,000 in 1983 selling mutual funds. Right. And because I had a cash flow from my earned income, I was able to use a cash flow and borrow against the cash flow. OK, understood. So what happened next? You, you made that first three point five million in what you said, four years. Well, uh, that's how... just I, I, all along the way. I was doing other things. Uh, but I say this to you, if. You, you recognize and you're early in an industry or a sector, right? Uh, the, what, you, what you would do, in other words, if you had come to Toronto in 90 or any, or, or, or any America, Miami, or even Miami, you had, you had gone to a major city in 1970 and you could see clear down through 2023 today. What you'd have seen back in 19. 70 in Toronto was a downtown Toronto was a lot of green space, right? And when, when you peer into the future, when you predict the future, you would see high rise buildings all over the place. If you could have, if you can predict so with, with such clarity, what would you have done back in 1970 had you come to Toronto and seen all the, the green space, knowing that by 2023 there's going to be high rise buildings sprouting out of the ground like weed? What would you have done, Kalila? Oh, oh, I have no idea. I'd have to think well, about the first that. Thing the first thing you'd have done, Kalila, is load up your front pocket, your back pocket, your side pockets with real estate. And then mm. when, you're, when you're finished loading up your pockets, you now start an aggregating vehicle whereby you can say friends, family, who, everybody, I'm aggregating real estate. I can do it for you through, and through this vehicle a fund, an aggregating vehicle, and we'll just buy up real estate. Because by 2023, real estate is going to be many multiples of what it is today. That's what you'd have done. And so that's basically what I did. I bought McKenzie as a start in 83. And then I started an aggregating vehicle to buy up all the mutual fund management companies in Canada, So, uh, which was the AIC Advantage Fund. When I started that fund, it had only $800,000 in other people's money, in assets under management. Uh, but that was 1987. By 20, 1998, which is 11 years later, we had $15 billion. Wow. Uh, it, the Advantage Fund was the largest private, the, sorry, the AIC was the largest privately owned mutual fund company in Canada. We managed money for over 1 million Canadians. Start, start, starting with, a basic premise, PPP, predict, plan, persevere. Uh, once you predict, you, you plan by, in this case, I aggregated asset management businesses when they were very, when the industry was embryonic. 
So what you described when you talk, you spoke about the, the Toronto landscape and then how, you know, all the high rises came up. It kind of sounds like where Kingston is right now. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the opportunity for us right now who are investors in Jamaica? Uh, you, you're, you're right, uh, Kalila. Uh, Jamaica is fertile because there, there, there's three, there, there's some preconditions I look at before making an investment. The first thing is there must be a difference between perception and reality. Because when there's a difference between perception and reality, you have the knowledge arbitrage, right? If everybody knows the same thing, you can't create any wealth. Secondly, there must be inefficiencies. If things are already efficient, you cannot create wealth. And thirdly, there must well, be a lack of... Jamaica have enough of that inefficiency. That's exactly, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. And thirdly, the third precondition is that there must be a lack of capital. Because when mm -hmm. there's a lack of capital, any incremental dollar is well treated. So those three conditions are present in Jamaica, right? Uh, so you look at, you, you, you pick a, you a long-term seg growth segment. If, uh, real estate, real estate in Jamaica, uh, we, you will it will always be a good great store of wealth. Jamaica will continue to grow, uh, so you have that underlining uh, tide, rising tide. Uh, so we have seen that movie play out before in other cities. Uh, Jamaica, the Jama Jamaican real estate is very undervalued. You lift mm -hmm. your, your typical home from Jamaica and put it in, parachute it into Cayman, it's worth five times as much. Why do you think that is? Why is it undervalued here? Well, uh, because, why is it undervalued? Because we don't have access, access to financing is tough in Jamaica, right? Getting access to financing is not easy in Jamaica as it is in other countries, in developed countries. Uh, so access to finance is a pro is an issue that has caused the price prices to remain stagnant, relatively speaking. True. You know, another area that a lot of people are excited about right now globally is AI, especially we've seen the past six months to a year, the advancements have been rapid in artificial intelligence. Is that an industry, because you said that you need to predict what's going to be hot in 10 years. Is that an industry that you think has tremendous growth potential that you're looking at? Uh, it may have tremendous growth potential, but it is an industry that I am not, uh, I'm not, I don't have an, an understanding enough of it that I can mm. predict the future. Remember PPP? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to predict with confidence. So I don't have uh, that, that predictive capabilities in that area. I don't understand the industry enough. And I'm not, not around enough people who do understand it. So that's not one an area that I personally would be investing in because I don't have the confidence that I understand it well enough. And there are many people who would understand it better than I would, so they run circles around me. I won't have the I want to have the advantage whereby I understand and I can hold my own. Understood. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. So, guys, if you have a very good understanding of AI, you know, take your chances there with the formula that Michael Leachin has outlined for you this evening. We're all taking notes. Let's talk about your investments in Jamaica, one of the largest ones being NCB. How did that happen? How did you end up uh, coming into NCB, investing in NCB? Well, going back to the three preconditions I mentioned before I, I would make an investment. The first being there must be a difference between perception and reality. The second being there must be uh, inefficiencies. And the third being there must be a lack of capital. So uh, Jamaica, and this was back in 2002, uh, the, we had the banking crisis in the late uh, 1990s and NCB was, uh, was in FinSAC, on the stewardship of FinSAC. So if perception versus reality. Most people, most international investors 
wouldn't perceive of Jamaica as an investment haven. They would not, right? You just don't think of Jamaica as investment nirvana. But what I saw was Scotiabank came to Jamaica before it went to Toronto. Jamaica was the first uh, uh, endeavor of Scotiabank outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Jamaica was this first step outside of Canada and outside of Halifax in 1888. And Scotia in 2001 made 25% of its after-tax earnings. Scotia International made 29% of its after-tax earnings from Jamaica. Scotia was in 50 countries then. This is prior to going into Latin America. So one country, Jamaica, they're making 25% of their profits, Scotia International. Scotia General, uh, which includes head office in Canada, made 8% of its profits in 2001 from Jamaica. So I thought, Scotia, if you ask Scotia, uh, if Jamaica is an investment haven, they'll say, absolutely, we're making a lot of profits, a disproportionate amount of profits from Jamaica. So perception versus reality. They, they, they knew the reality because they were on the ground. Uh, number two, uh, the second precondition was there must be inefficiencies. We know there are lots of inefficiencies in Jamaica. And Scotch NCB was particularly inefficient because it was managed by, uh, by uh, it was not owned. There was no owner. It was managed by the government, basically. Uh, so it was very inefficient. And thirdly, there, there, there wasn't too much capital available in Jamaica to buy NCB. So NCB met those three criteria, uh, preconditions, uh, and hence that was my inspiration to go and, and buy it in 2002. But having bought it, and the, the other reason I bought it was there are many investors, international investors that looked at uh, NCB, and they read. They can read a balance sheet probably better than I. I can. I'm not an accountant, so they passed. Most investors passed. In fact, one institution, uh, financial institution, said, "This is not a bank. This is an ugly monkey, right?" Mm. T towards NCB. So, what did I see in NCB that that, that was uh, alluring? Well. You know, when you look at an investment, you can look at the balance sheet, which is what, is what most people do. But the the the, the uh, business person uh, would say, "Hmm, are there some intangibles that this business owns that would not be on the balance sheet that I can get for free?" And yes, there was a big intangible with NCB that was nowhere on the balance sheet, and that oh, intangible, okay. eh? What was that? Yeah, you're about to tell us. That intangible was, it was the emotional connection between the National Commercial Bank of Jamaica, NCB, and the, and the Jamaicans, the Jamaican people, that emotional connection, because it wasn't National Commercial Bank of Germany or Canada. It was mm -hmm. the National Commercial Bank of Jamaica. It was the People's Bank. So mm -hmm. that was the emotional connection. So the, 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 the question was, that I had to ask myself as a new owner was how do I uh, uh, how do I translate transform that emotional connection into cash flow and business for the bank? So how did you do it? So how how did you turn around NCB? Because when you took it over, it was nowhere near what it is today. Well, uh, we just we we did two things, a, a couple of things. But the first was. Uh, when I, when I bought the bank, I thought, what's the highest value add this bank can give to Jamaica? What's the highest value add this vessel, this bank can give, build, give to building a better Jamaica? And the answer kept coming back to me, make Jamaica wealthy. Right? So, so how do you use a, a bank to make a country wealthy? Well, how do countries become wealthy. Well, countries become wealthy by doing two things. Number one, reinvesting, reinvesting profits. And number two, reinvesting in keeping the best and brightest in the country. Okay? So the first thing we did was we'll say we had a card called key card. We said 
whenever Jamaicans, whenever you use key card, we will reinvest 1% of your spend in education, right? So that your kids will have an opportunity to complete high school, complete their CXX, CXCs, uh, to get a, a scholarship to a uh, university. And that's what we did. Secondly, we will build a business so emin, uh, eminent in its statue globally that young, bright Jamaicans we say, I don't need to go to uh, Canada. I don't even need to emigrate to uh, Germany or uh, uh, the United States. I can get my emotional, my, 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 my economic, my professional fulfillment right here in Jamaica at NCB. So we want to build a business that is so eminent in its reputation that young, bright Jamaicans will aspire. The best and brightest will say, I don't need to go anywhere else. I can get it here or uh, any, of, any, any of the NCB group of companies. We have a lot of questions in the chat, Mr. Leachin. I think this is a great one to start us off with. Jason says, what failures did you have on your way to success? Well, the, 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 the failure huh, was when I stepped outside of my circle of competence. Mm. And my circle of competence would have been uh, defined by the five laws of wealth creation. So, so uh, I decided when I was, when I started AIC, actually, to get into the pork processing business to make ham and bacon, right? I knew nothing about it. But I got into that business and it was a mess because I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about uh, the, 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 the it, it's a low margin business and you have to have scale. I didn't put enough capital into it to, to get the scale. Uh, so, so and, and I didn't know, and, and people were actually stealing from the business. So that was a total disaster. So. I stick to my knitting knitting right now. <laughs> Makes sense. Next question comes from El, El Sharawi. A lot of us have brilliant ideas, but lack the required capital financing. How can I get this financing? I want a hundred thousand US dollar loan from your bank, but I'm sure I won't get it. <laughs> well, well, if you have that attitude, you're sure you're not going to get it. You won't get it, right? So you have to have a positive attitude. So, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, I started off by, I was, I was selling mutual funds, but not only was I selling, I was very uh, dedicated to investing from the get, taking my cash flow and investing it. The first thing I did was to buy a home. So owning a home is the foundation for wealth creation. So all of us should aspire should suck or got in to buy a home. Because when you buy a home, uh, you pay a mortgage, you, the, your, your, your principal is being paid down over time and you have value being developed, you have equity. Then you can take the equity out of the home and make an investment into yourself first, right? Uh, your best investment is to invest in yourself. Mm, all right. And I see a lot of other comments similar to that one saying it's difficult getting the getting the capital to start up whatever business people are trying to start up. But you said invest in yourself first, own your home. But let me point out this, Mr. Leachin, the housing market now is a lot, lot different than what it was back in the 80s and even the 90s when you would have been making those investments on the personal side. It is a lot more difficult and expensive to own a home today. So do you still think that applies in this environment, this economic environment? Yes, because it will, it will, it will become even more expensive 10 years from now. Mm. Mm. All right. It, let's it, it, it has always been, it has always been that getting started, owning your first home was always a difficulty. It has, that has always been the case of affordability. So, uh, but, you start small and you grow you, you grow your way up let's fast forward to some of the more recent developments we were talking about ncb not too long ago and it was announced recently that you're going to be taking a three-month leave of absence 
from NCB Financial Group to focus on operations in your Canadian company. So yes. can you walk us through what led to that decision of you taking leave? Well, firstly, uh, there is a lot going on here uh, in, in Canada in terms of two areas of endeavor that I am pursuing wholeheartedly. The first is uh, I've invested heavily in, uh, the, in cancer oncology and specifically treating cancer at the cellular, cellular level, not just chemotherapy or uh, radiation therapy. It's identifying cancer, the, 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 the receptor on particular receptor on a, uh, the, the, that is, a, is unique to a particular cancer. Each cancer cell has a unique receptor on them. So what we do is we find a protein molecule that is attracted to that receptor. And once we can get to that receptor on that cancer cell, we can attach a radioisotope, in, the, in this case, gallium-68, to the protein molecule, which takes the gallium-68 to the infected cells and the infected cells only. And then it, that light, the gallium-68 can now light up on a, on a PET scan. So we can see exactly where the cancer is, wherever it is. And once we can see it, we can treat it. In other words, what we now do is replace the gallium-68 with uh, another radioisotope by the name of lutetium-177 uh, and it get, uh, attach it to the, uh, to the protein molecule, which takes the lutetium to the infected cells and in the lutetium emits uh, beta rays, which are two millimeters in length, zaps the cancer and leave neighboring cells alone. So that is a modality of treatment that is fastly supplanting traditional chemotherapy and radiation, and you don't get any side effects. That's Ooh. the first thing. The second, the second area of endeavor is most countries have signed up to be carbon net. We're talking about prediction now, okay? Most countries have signed up to be, to be carbon net zero by 2050. We have an, a humankind has an ex existential threat. It's, the, it's coming from carbonization of the world. So if we don't stop using fossil fuels, we, 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 we will have, it's, as I said, it's an existential threat to, to humanity. So currently, the current energy mix that is typical in every country would be, I define as the hub and spoke. At the hub, you have uh, fossil fuels, and the spokes would be renewable energy, uh, uh, sun, wind, etc., hydro, etc. But it's the hub, which is uh, the energy, fossil fuels at the hub, which is causing all these nasty problems carbonization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to replace that, uh, fos those fossil fuels with a clean, high density fuel that is scalable and is always on, which is on the only one is nuclear. So the, the fuel mix for countries in the future will be nuclear will be at the center, the hub, and you will have renewables as the, as the spoke. So, that, that's, that, is the pre, that has to come. So countries, including Jamaica, will have to move away from fossil fuels, and they have made a commitment. By 2050, they will have to be carbon net zero. Industries and the country as a whole has to be carbon net zero, and that's throughout, throughout the world. So, but countries, as I said, nuclear has to be at the center. So there's a huge demand for nuclear know-how coming, but most countries don't have the nuclear muscle. So therein lies a fantastic business opportunity. So what I've done is starting an ecosystem whereby I can go to any country in the world, any, and say, look, you have a problem, Miss, Mr. Sheik, or Ms. President, or Mr. Prime Minister. What's the problem, Mike? Well, you signed up for this carbon net zero by 2050. How are you going to achieve it? I don't know. It was the right, it was the thing to have done at the time, but we don't know mm. how to do it. So, okay, I've put together an ecosystem that will solve that problem for you. Whether you are Abu Dhabi, Dubai, or Jamaica, or anywhere in between. So the ecosystem consists of, we signed an MOU with the Canadian Nuclear Laboratory, 
which is the repository for all things nuclear in Canada. It's a national nuclear laboratory. It has 1,600 nuclear engineers and 600 PhD nuclear scientists. So if you Google Portland and CNL, Canadian Nuclear Laboratory, you see the MOU. First time in the world it has ever been done. Whereby we can, we'll collaborate uh, their IP and we'll take their IP and be able to uh, go to countries to help them to become carbon net zero. Uh, but at the, same, at the same time, part of the ecosystem has to be, has to consist of being a the small modular reactor, which is like a miniaturized nuclear plant, will be what will be the energy source of the future, SMRs. So ladies and gentlemen, Google SMRs and start educating yourselves because that will be the energy source of the future, right? Mm. So we had to get the domain experience of owning an SMR company. So, so that when we, when, we, when we go to any country, we could say we could offer them complete end-to-end -end services, including rolling out an, a, a, a program for small modular reactors and also a program for manufacturing hydrogen as a source of fuel for, for automation, right? So the ecosystem is now complete. We have Canadian nuclear laboratories uh, and we have uh, a, a company which is going to be the first SMR company in the world to be rolled out, to be operationalized. It's called USNC, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation out of Seattle, right? So we can now go to any country. And if you're to Google Portland and MBM Holdings, you'll see that uh, we've signed an MOU, a, a, a MOU with uh, MBM Holdings, which is uh, the ruling family of Dubai, uh, to take this uh, our, our know-how and help Dubai to achieve their vision 33, 23. Wow. That's a big contract. Well, it's not a contract. First thing, we, we, we're going to work together to on, on that project. Oh, it's a MOU, for, for, not a contract yet. But Jason says, sounds like you're planning to bring competition to JPS because Jamaica has those same goals. We have signed on to, I, I don't even remember what it was, 50% by 2030 or something like that. Uh, so are you planning to bring this type of technology to Jamaica? Yes, you can see more and more conversations happening in the public domain about nuclear. And, uh, and that's just not only in Jamaica, but globally. Uh, every day, because as we, 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 we get closer to 2050, you will see more and more uh, sensitization about the benefits of nuclear and also the safety of nuclear. How safe is it? Well, uh, when, when, when the, 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 the book, uh, when you think of nuclear, you, you, three, th three disasters would come to mind. Fukushima in Japan, Chernobyl in the, uh, Ukraine, uh, in Russia, and Three Mile Islands uh, in America. And those are the big boogeymen when, when people want to scare you about uh, nuclear. But in Fukushima, although it is, uh, it is so well advertised, no one died. In, th on, in Three Mile Islands, no one died. Nuclear is safer than solar wind in terms of number of deaths per energy generated. It's the safest of all. And when you see, you see, just think about the, the practice, the, 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 uh, the common sense nature of it. You've heard of nuclear submarines and nuclear warships, right? Mm -hmm. They're all and they're all SMRs. They have a small nuclear plant on them. And when was the last thing you heard of one of them melting down? You don't. The nuclear plant of today is the fourth generation nuclear plant that are now will be built in factories so you can manufacture them uh, like cars and they're passively safe. So you, you can't, they can't have a meltdown. Well, I don't know enough about it to challenge anything you said, so I'm just going to take your word at it. But let's come back to, because I asked you that question because we were asking about NCB and you leaving are uh, you taking a leave of absence, a three-month leave of absence? So these are your two pet projects right now, cancer research and nuclear energy. Uh, Gregory wants to know, 
He says, the shareholders of NCB Bank are concerned. We see the share price plunging, mainly because of the interest rate, NCB scandals, and a lack of dividends. What are your plans to address these issues? Those are real. Those are real. Uh, those are good comments. Uh, share price plunging because of, for all those reasons, uh, the main one being a lack of dividends, right? Uh, and I can assure you that it is a concern for everybody at NCB. Uh, to this point, NCB has been uh, uh, damning its cash flow because if you look at it, the business is very profitable, right? Very, very profitable. Hitting record profits. Last year, last year NCB made how much? $39 billion, $39 billion. Uh, so it's very profitable. The company uh, has been storing dividends to, to make sure that the unknown challenges that uh, uh, are ahead, if they are, we're, we're, we're meant, we maintain the strength of uh, a, a strong balance sheet. So at some point, though, at some point, uh, dividends will be paid. And the erudite investor should always look at the business. The business is doing well. It's a great business. And NCB has a strong position in Jamaica. And because of our ownership of Guardian, we, 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 are, we have a fantastic insurance business right through the Caribbean. So if you look at the business itself, it's, it, is being, it is selling today at book value. Book value. NCB should be selling for two times book, which is twice as much. So those people who are confident about, uh, who, who have confidence, will be should be investing now because that's how wealth is created. You buy low. Mm -hmm. But so what, 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 what most people do when things are, uh, when, when they think that they smell a crisis, they run for the hills. But you must always remember, the Chinese definition of the word crisis is crisis like it's like a formula. Crisis equals danger plus opportunity. So you can't you can't get a, an opportunity unless there's a crisis. So when people say, "Oh my gosh, the world is falling down," that's when you should be saying, "I know, I feel afraid." Then you know there's a crisis. Then you should be saying. Let me, let me study myself and remember the Chinese definition. Crisis equals danger plus opportunity. So instead of me running for the years, I should study myself and say, hmm, where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities in this perceived crisis? Mm -hmm. Right? In this case, the price stock price is cheap. So anything is cheap, you buy. And the good thing about buying shares, in the case of NCB, you can buy one share for $70, right? So you want everybody- Two years ago, it was over $200. Exactly. And you look at the earnings, you look at the earnings, the earnings have not fallen uh, pr uh, 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 proportionately. Or the earnings, we have been there, bank has been doing very well. It's, it's, the, it's the most profitable business in Jamaica. So speaking of, you know, buying and selling. You've recently sold a number of assets. So you sold the yachts, which everybody was, you know, had an opinion on when you had it there in, in Portland. You sold CVM uh, late last year. You have the house for Ca in Cayman up for sale. It was reported. And I think there are a couple of other things as well. So what is Michael Leachin up to right now? Why, why all these assets being sold? You know, time? you know, periodically you have to take stock. Uh, it's, it's like spring cleaning, right? Uh, you accumulate these things and then you say, hmm, uh, am I getting optimal use out of these assets? Right? Agent stage. What should I be doing? What, what should, how should I be allocating my capital today? Do I have better areas to invest, to allocate, allocate capital? And I just gave you two wonderful areas. Cancer. Uh, and investing in that in that area because we're in a strong growth mode, unfortunately. And clean energy, we're in a, we're using nuclear, and that's a huge opportunity. So, it's a, we all should reassess 
how we are allocate capital periodically because see, over time you accumulate and you may not need all the things that you accumulate. Talk truth though, how nice was the yacht? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> did, it, did it pain you to give it up? Huh? Well, it you, 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 know, it up? you know, I, I, I say this to you and the view and our viewers. Uh, when I, when I was, when I did not own a big house, I aspired to a big house, right? Now that I own a big house, I said to myself, Mike, how many rooms do you really use of the big house? How many rooms do you really use? And invariably, it's probably no more than three, right? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, your, 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 your perspective over time change cars you get initially i thought man i need the latest ferrari right but today you, you buy a ferrari the the thrill of ownership uh would last a couple of weeks then you move on to something else so so but you, you, one has to go through it to get it out of your system mm. right uh, so it's it's a matter of prioritizing how you how you live how you spend your your time how you spend your your how your assets are allocated and just want to make sure that you, you can manage and you're actually getting utility out of what you own makes sense makes sense so you're saying asset allocation right now you're reallocating so those assets reallocating into these two areas that you are focusing heavily on right now uh, which are cancer research, nuclear energy, yes? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So another question we've been getting a lot. When that announcement initially came out, people were saying, what's wrong with Michael Leachin? Is he sick? Is something? Is everything okay? Can you set the record straight on that? Well, uh, I'm 72, okay? And every year I make sure that I can do my age in push-ups. Mm -hmm. So yesterday morning, I did 73, non-stop. Did I answer that, that question? You're eh? fit as a fiddle in great health. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome. I'm gonna take one last question because quite a few people were asking in the chat and we're we took this interview way over our usually allocated time because people are, are really into it. Uh, one last question. Where is it? I saw a few people asking the same question. Uh, is he interested? Okay, here we go. Nakisia, is he interested? Are you interested in using your formula to mentor a group of people who would be able to replicate it to the mass of young interested adults? So lots of people asking <coughs> if you would be interested in mentoring young Jamaicans right now? 100% Kalila. So I make you a deal, Kalila. Mm -hmm. uh, you put together the forum and I will turn up. What? Yes. What that to me? <laughs> you put together the forum because you're a genius at that and I'll turn up and do whatever I can to, uh, to, to, to impart my uh, whatever I can to so that others can learn from my experiences. That's my. Done. That's also a passion Done. that I have. So you Done. put together the Done. forum, and I'll turn up. I listen. I got you. We will. We'll make this happen. I know that. I know the perfect forum already. So yes, and the more scaled, scaled it is, the better because we help more people. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me, Mr. Lee Chin. I really appreciate you being here and extending that very generous offer as well. My pleasure. As I said, my, I am beholden to my country because if, it, if I had not gotten a scholarship from Jamaica, I would not be here today. So I'll never forget that. Absolutely. Wow. Very great interview. Thank you so much once again.